Good morning. Very nice to see you all again. Now we're going to do something extremely fun. My mom always said, life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. I think I'm having what the Germans call a schadengasm. What do they teach you to talk like this in some Panama City sailor want a hump hump bar? Or is this getaway day and your last shot at his whiskey? Sell crazy someplace else. We're all stocked up here. Guess what? I got a fever. And the only prescription is for cowbell. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Sunday live stream. Good to see y'all here. Got a few familiar friends joining here. Um, we'll say hello to you all in a minute. Today, what we're going to do is talk about an important concept in painting. Whenever people approach me or ask me about how to get better at painting and, you know, in my own struggles with getting better at painting, I talk about the thing that helped me most probably, which was the approach you take to laying down color. I learned oil painting first. Uh, at least I, that's what I got into uh, more uh, avidly than other, any other medium at the time when I started getting a good art education at my school here in San Diego where I went to. And at that school, they actually taught that uh, a, the best introduction to, say, oil painting, this great fine art medium, is actually gouache painting. And gouache, if you don't know, is a watercolor-based medium, and it functions a lot like watercolor, meaning it's thinned down with waters, but can use it almost completely pure and undiluted out of the tube, and it's very thick, and it goes down opaque. It'll actually cover, unlike watercolors. Uh, but it doesn't spread very far when you do that. And what that does is it actually teaches you to paint in what are called small tiles of color. If you think about tiles being like mosaic tiles or stained glass tiles where you have a distinct shape, if you're working in mosaics or tiles, you have to predetermine what the size and shape and color of that tile is before you lay it down. And it's basically the same concept when you're painting in oils or gouache in particular, uh, because it dries so fast, you don't really have the ability to scrub it and spread it around. You, you do a little bit. There's some leeway there. And the more water you add, the more you can spread it around. But the more water you add to gouache, the thinner it gets and the less able you are to reactivate that paint later with water. Because the cool thing about this tile painting method with gouache 
is that you can um, reactivate the paint at a later date, any later date. As far as I know, years later, I mean, maybe after a few years, it might get a little too dry, but um, the theory is you can always reactivate gouache and blend the edges between tiles whenever you want. So there's a lot of room to uh, grow and learn and experiment with gouache. Unlike with watercolors, you once it's dried, you're pretty much stuck with it. And acrylic painting, once it's dry, you're pretty much stuck with it. Uh, however, these lessons can definitely be applied to acrylic painting just with some modification in your technique. Uh, and today I'm going to be doing a demo that's digital, but I'm going to uh, treat it like it's a gouache painting. I'm going to lay down hard edge tiles of color that are a certain shape and size and then blend and smudge them later. So I'm going to um, show you first a couple of examples uh, of some past work that I've done, some recent work and some older work, and then do a couple demos. So with that in mind, let's just real quick say hello to some of the folks that are here. We got Sargon from Uzbekistan. Hey, and Mick, Alan, Luis from Colombia. Hey, hey, Butch and uh, Atli from Norway, Jim and Carlton. Hey, good to see you all. So if anyone else wants to say hello in the chat, feel free to chime in. And of course, pop up with any questions you have in the chat. And Debbie will be here in a minute to help me with those. So let's take a look at the workspace here. And I've got, let's see, let's, I want to first show you some of my old gouache paintings that I did at the Atelier School. This is a gouache head study I did from an old photo. I believe it's Robert Taylor, the actor. And uh, so, yeah, this is gouache. And the background, you can tell, was laid in really thin. It's like a watercolor wash in the background. There was a lot of water mixed in with the paint. But then as you proceed with the gouache painting, you add less and less water for, to the strokes so that the paint strokes actually go down like opaque tiles of color. And you can see there's actually a lot of tiling here, like here on the forehead. It's what I call tiling. It's what the teacher called it. So that's just the term that stuck with me. I mean, there's other terms you might want to call it, or, you know, if you can think of something better. Uh, there's a lot of tiles down here in the beard that are unblended. Uh, but for the most part, I did blend a lot of these tiles. There's areas like around the eye here that there's, there are some hard edges, but definitely got blended. So what this teaches you is a really, really good concept in painting, other than just good shape design, is you're learning uh, about hard and soft edges. Uh, because every edge that you lay down in a gouache painting is a hard edge, just by default. It's just a, it's just a type of paint that goes down. You don't necessarily, it doesn't automatically blend with everything that's around it. Unlike with, with oils, with oils, it's super easy to blend for hours and hours afterwards. It stays wet. So it's really easy in oil painting to let yourself uh, accidentally or, you know, whatever, just scrub too much, blend too much. And oil paintings by people who are struggling tend to be over blended and washed out and all the colors mix in with all the other colors because it's very tempting to do that blending. With gouache, you just can't do that. So it's a great training medium for oil paintings because of that, because you get into the habit of laying down these tiles these distinct shapes that are a color and a value that you have to really think about because you actually, with gouache, you can't go over it too many times or it will, you know, it'll be very difficult to paint. Like it's harder to paint, you know, a light color on top of a dark color, for instance. The dark color will want to show through, even though it is opaque. Uh, there's some weird quirks to it. You'll figure it out when if you ever work with gouache, but it's a good a good gouache painting to me is a can look like an oil painting. It'll have a nice transition. It'll have a nice combination of hard edges versus soft edges. It'll have the uh, impression of texture uh, because of that. It'll have a lot more visual interest. Here's another one I did. It's a, a caricature of uh, Saruman the White from Lord of the Rings. Uh, yeah, this one this is one I had a lot of fun with. Uh, but on this one, I didn't actually blend too many of the tiles. I actually kind of liked the look of this uh, these hard edge tiles everywhere. It gave it kind of a cool design. And I think this was later in the course when I was getting a little more confident with the application of the gouache paint. And so if you look real close, I mean, there, there are cool, some cool uh, dry brushing techniques you can do to get nice textures. But for the most part, it's these hard, thick tiles of color, these mosaic tiles. And there's really cool... Uh, color notes in there. There's ochres and olives and blues and pinks. And, and But they all work because the values are correctly chosen. You know, I got lucky on a lot of this. And, uh, you know, I, it turned out pretty well for the most part. I mean, there are some problems with it. I mean, the, I think the shadows are maybe a little too purple. Um, and I might blend the edges a little differently because this, this was like, 
I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago I did this, like in the mid-early 2000s. Uh, but uh, and I haven't done a lot of gouache painting since I left the school, but I get back to it every now and then. But I always recommend, because of my experience with it, that it's a great, great training tool uh, to learn painting in general, just good painting concepts. And here's just a portrait head study I did, some like historical reenactor, I guess. Uh, but a lot of tiles and metal. That's like really fun to paint metal with gouache because you can just do so many cool little color notes in there. A lot of dry brushing as well. And I mixed uh, the red of the uh, the hair on the, the helmet with the white of the background. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little rough. Not all the shapes are as well designed as I would like looking at it right now. It's a little sloppy, but it shows the gouache painting technique fairly well, I think. All right. Hey, a couple more people joining. We've got Pero Russo and A.L. Young, Ronnie and Wojtek from Poland. Good to see you guys here. Thanks. All right. So um, let's get into the digital aspect of it, though. So you might have seen from my thumbnail image, this was this Christopher Walken I painted uh, a couple days ago just to sort of practice and get ready for this. Uh, it looks a lot like the gouache paintings. Uh, but it's all digital and how i did this was just with the lasso tool you know the freehand lasso tool where you just draw a selection and fill it so i didn't use a paintbrush pretty much on all of this it's just the lasso tool and uh you can use the uh i think there's the geometric lasso tool the one where you can do like just straight lines or the one where you just draw it freehand and you know just kind of looks like uh like this basically and then you fill it um, I'll go over that process, though, when I actually do my demos. Uh, but so this entire thing was done that way. I didn't use any paint brushes. And then what I did was I used a smudge tool from my Court Jones Photoshop uh, brush pack. So this is the result of just smudging this painting. No additional paint strokes were used. I didn't apply pigment with a paintbrush for this whole painting. Uh, it's literally just the smudge tools. And I have a couple different smudge tools. Some are streaky. Some have texture applied to them uh, but it can get a really cool effect and this is a lot more painterly than i normally paint in my uh, typical caricature work and uh you know i realized you no know, this is a great way to develop a style this is makes a very cool look and uh you know it just so happened i got a good likeness on this i think i'm pretty happy with it um and all the drawing was done with the lasso tool i didn't draw with a paintbrush with a pencil i didn't have an underlying drawing uh just Use the selection to the lasso selection tool. Uh, and here's another one I did last night as well. Uh, let's see, I've got a lot of files open here. There we go. Uh, so I did a uh, Bowie all tiles. You can see just hard edges everywhere. Even for the smoke over here, it's just it's a bunch of geometric abstract shapes essentially. And so each of these shapes had to be consciously designed. I had to figure out what shape, what edges, I, or what, you know, basically what were the contours, what were the shapes of this cheekbone shadow, what were the shapes for the bottom plane of the nose, what are the shapes that the eyebrow and the eyes make together. Well, they can be bind into one simple shape. You know, here's the uh, reference photo, by the way. So I had to make all those decisions, and that helps you become a better painter in general because you're training yourself to translate natural organic shapes into like a simplified, uh, abstract, hard-edged shape that you have to make clear decisions about. And you have to figure out how many values you, you want really to tell the story. So this, again, is another way to simplify the number of values in your painting just because you don't, you know, you, you get, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a laborious process to work this way, so you don't want to keep on adding values on top of values. Like I would take the value from the hair and use that for the eye and eyebrow, or the value from the under, underside of the cheek and use that on the the shadow on the side of the neck. So you've often heard the, you know, the advice in art probably that you should limit your values to like three or four values in a study or in a painting. And this will really help you do that. You can actually just create three or four or five values on a little sample palette over on the left or on the side of the canvas. And you can select from those if you want. I just happened to eyeball all these. I didn't use a predetermined palette. So there might be actually more than three or four. There might be six. And, uh, but that's all right. It still limits the number of values you're using in the painting. And then the uh, this is the smudged result here. Again, no paintbrushes were used. It's just I smudged the existing uh, strokes. And I left a lot of the hard edges in there still. Like with the walk-in painting, you can see a lot of these hard edges are still preserved. They're not over-blended. There's this nice hard on the nose, 
uh, on the nostril here. There's this, anywhere there's like a really strong light, it's really good to have an accent light or highlight that's a hard edge. And so that's just a personal style choice. There's no one right answer for where you leave a hard edge and where you leave a, leave a soft edge. I mean, generally, you, you can soften edges where two values are close to each other in value. Uh, is a good place to blend uh, blend an edge. But, uh, you know, where there's high contrast, you can leave a hard edge. But you may not want a super hard edge everywhere where it's a high contrast because that can draw a lot of focus, like the back of the head up against the background here. I ended up softening that as well just because I didn't want it to be such a hard edge that the eye would just focus right on. So I broke it up a little bit with the smudge tools. All right, so... Um, that is basically the breakdown of the examples of what I'm going to try to achieve today. And I'm going to do a couple examples uh, painting wise. I'm going to uh, do just a real simple piece of uh, fruit at first and then do a caricature. So where's my fruit? I got to better close down some of these. How you doing, Debbie? Are you here? I'm here. Hey, welcome. I'm hungry. Yeah, hungry. Well, you're going to love this. It's my my apple picture. Oh, no, it's an onion. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so hopefully that doesn't make you too hungry. But this is just a real simple shape I thought would be a good uh, model for uh, for the uh, demo, the first demo today. So I'm going to keep mine off screen, but you guys can keep it. Uh, you guys can see it here on the left. Yeah, Sargon, it looks like vector art. Exactly. And you can do a vector art painting if you want to do something with a Bezier tool, like an Illustrator, and then bring it into Photoshop. You can totally do that as well. You just have to rasterize it or make it into pixels. Uh, and AL says, Marco Bucci did some nice videos on color, value, and shape. Yeah, ch check out Marco's YouTube page, Marco Bucci. He has some great, great stuff to, uh, to look at. All right, so to paint this, first what I want to do is actually pull the window a little bit larger than the actual artboard size, just because I'm going to need to, when I'm using the uh, lasso tool here, I'm going to need to go beyond the borders to get everything filled in properly. Because I don't, I'm not using just the fill bucket command. I'm drawing a selection first and then filling it. Oh, and by the way, in case you're wondering, I've got this express key remote I'm holding up here in front of the camera. Uh, I've got all of my keyboard shortcuts hooked up to this, like lasso tool, fill tool, clear, uh, Alt, Shift, they're all hooked up to this right now. So I won't be using my keyboard. I used my keyboard on the Christopher Walken painting and it was so like problematic going back and forth constantly looking for the right keyboard shortcut or I would use the window, you know, the toolbox on the left over here. Uh, but it really interrupted my workflow and working this way is a little cumbersome. Uh, it might be kind of frustrating for some, but if you can make it easier with something like an express key remote or the side keys on your tablet, uh, I would recommend setting those up ahead of time. It'll make things go a little faster. But anyway, first I'm going to lay in a background here. I'm just going to draw around the entire area. And I'm going to choose, uh, I guess, just sort of a grayish tone, because that's what I see in the background of this onion painting here. And I'm going to go ahead and fill that. And go back to my lasso tool. And I'm actually going to create, I don't know, just sort of a uh, abstract shape, sort of a vignette of a slightly lighter color. Fill that in. Maybe one more over here. And I am using the color window over here to actually choose my colors, the little the little spectrum value box over here. Okay. And so that's my basically my background. Now let's go ahead and draw this onion shape. So I'll draw the main body of the onion here. It's a little bit of a uh, odd shape. So I'm going to add to it. I actually have shift, you know, as a keyboard shortcut here. So if I want to modify the existing selection, I just have to hold down shift while uh, uh, while drawing the selection. And if you want to de you know, take away from the selection, you just hold down the alt key on a, a PC. I'm not sure what that is on a Mac. What is that on a Mac, Debbie, the alt key? Probably option. And if you're on a tablet, like a window, like a iPad or something, I don't know. And then we draw the little crown up top here. It doesn't have to be exact. Uh, we can figure that out later. Just want to fill this now. And I'm going to just use an overall value for this onion here. I'm just eyeballing the photo, 
I'm just trying to get in the neighborhood. I mean, I want it to be accurate. I don't want to have to go back and fix it. So really trying to be making a good decision here. I don't want to have to correct it later. Yeah, that fits pretty good. Yeah, if there are actual um, other broken up shapes behind the uh, selection you're doing, like two different colors, you might actually have to uh, uh, fill twice. Or you can use a paintbrush technically to, to just scrub over the selection. I might do a little bit of that later, but don't really need to do it right now. Uh, I'm going to add a little bit more roundness to the shape on the bottom side here. There we go. Feels a little bit better. Okay. Now the next thing I'm going to do is grab a color to create sort of the highlights and the darker forms. Uh, I want to just break it up into its lighter and darker constituent values. I'm just I'm analyzing the photo. and I'm, I'm squinting a lot at the photo too, I think. It's a good practice to get into. It helps you see where the lightest lights and the darkest darks are. So there's sort of a core shadow running through here. There's some uh, interesting darks here at the uh, top of the onion, the little crown area up here, whatever it's called. There we go. And not every single area of the selection got filled up. So what I will do is I will go to my paintbrush. I've got a hard edge brush here. Um, and I'm just going to fill the selection. If there's any stray areas that weren't filled by the paint bucket, I'll just sort of go over that area. But it's not going to paint outside the selection area at all. So I won't, I'm still not technically brushing on paint. I'm just using the paintbrush to fill gaps that were not filled by the fill tool, by the paint bucket tool. Okay, a bit of a reflected light over here. Looks a little bit lighter, maybe a little bit cooler. And I've got the eyedropper tool selected here as well. It's hooked up to my Express Key remote. Um, so if I, I just want to select the area that I'm modifying, so I'm just creating a slightly lighter value of this light color on the left side of the onion. So I want to go just a little bit lighter. And fill that. Then I think I go ahead and draw a uh, highlight. And I want to try to be fairly exact. I mean, it's not, this isn't the final shape it's going to be because I'm going to be smudging the edges. But I have to figure out, like, where do I want the thickest point? Where do I want the thinnest point? Uh, do I want to modify it at all? Yeah, let's maybe even give it a little more curvature here to the top. Uh, and then maybe a little bit of an edge over here that's picking up a highlight. So that's going to be the lightest light in the painting. So it's going to be nearly white. Uh, it's going to be a cooler color because it's cool light coming from a window. So it's going to be a little closer maybe to gray or blue. There we go. I think there should be a lighter color on the left side of the uh, top of the onion over here. And just gets just a little bit yellowish now. This sort of the dried onion skin parts that I'm going to uh, fill in here. Okay, and let's actually do the shadow as well behind the onion on the tabletop here on the counter. So I'm going to select that background and then come up with a darker version of that. 
we go. Fill that. All right, and that's, you know, that's a, I think, good enough to start. Well, I, I see one other area I want to add. You know, you don't have to re necessarily rush through this, but, you know, for the sake of having an interesting demo, I wanted to have, um, you know, make some pretty fast progress on this. Uh, let's go ahead and take, I'm going to take this actual color here from the uh, core shadow and fill that in right here. Okay. All right. So that actually, I think that's pretty good. Um, I'm going to go ahead and grab, I have three blender brushes in my brush pack uh, down here. I've got the canvas texture one, which blends with a strong canvas grain. I've got the wet bristles, which is sort of a, creates a lot of streaks. And then I have the, what I call the get lost blender, which is a really strong blender and it blends uh, the edges between things fairly well so that it like almost becomes a really soft edge. Like I'll start here with the shadow of the onion. Make that a little bit bigger. The shadows get a little harder edge when they get closer to the object that's casting them, but they blend away the further from the object. So that's a good thing to keep in mind when looking at your edges on a uh, shadow. And then the, the background as well, I'm going to blend that because I don't really want these hard vector looking edges. The fact that I can blend them now does create a cool, like, sort of a spotlight effect, or, you know, it highlights the area around the onion because now it's just this bright white, you know, this is a cool area uh, with this, it's sort of darker edges around the sides. Okay. And uh, see, so shrink that down a little bit. And I, I'll, I'll use this Get Lost Blender, I think, a bit here, but not too much. If I use it too much, it's going to soften every edge in the painting. And I don't necessarily want that. I want to create, you know, there's a lot of natural streaks in an onion. And so it'll be good to have the streaky brush for that. Okay, let's go over to like, I guess the wet bristle uh, blender. You can see this creates these really hard streaky edges right there. And so I'll go back and forth with those. I'm going to drag some of these uh, darker shapes up into the lights to help create those, uh, those natural streaks or uh, stripes, I don't know, layers that you see on this onion here, that the peel has. Make it a little bigger. If I blend some of the background into the onion, it actually creates that effect that there's sort of light bleed on the side of the onion where it's picking up some of that, it's reflecting some of that light that's in the actual background but it has to be done pretty carefully I mean this is this is one of those things that can definitely mess up if you're um, too eager or you're not confident with what you're doing with blending so you know it's about variety I'm changing up the direction of my strokes breaking up the form so they're not quite so you know obvious that these are originally hard edges okay let's try the canvas texture blender now it's a bit of a different effect. And this one actually picks up, I think this particular brush, the canvas blender, um, it, it definitely matters what color is selected as your foreground color, because it'll actually... Uh, it's it's like a loaded blender basically so it takes a foreground color and adds to your painting it doesn't just simply blend what's there it adds to it so if i like were to pick green it would add start adding green to the painting and blending it with what's there so be aware of that when you have that kind of blender Yeah, I'm going to select the, uh, say, a background color here and paint the background into the onion with the blender brush. But if I kept that, I had that same orange color, so the orange color was bleeding into the background, and I didn't necessarily want that. Okay, now I might actually go back and add some uh, lasso selections as well, if I feel it needs more... Um, 
details, more hard edges, you can definitely go back on top of your blended edges and uh, add more add more hard edges to everything with the selection tool. So Alan was mentioning that he actually uses the pen tool to do something like this, and you can do that as well, right? Totally. If that's save if you're more comfortable with that, definitely. Save a path. Yeah, um, I just happen to like this because I'm. It, it feels more painterly still. I feel like I'm a little more in control of it. But that's the great thing about these programs. There are so many different ways to get to the end, same end result. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna add some a little bit more of these um, stripes, stripey markings to the onion. It might be a little bit dark. And I am using the paintbrush here to fill in the selections because there's so many selections. I think if I just use the paint bucket command, the fill tool, it, it would take a while. I'd have to like dab in several of these. Um, I do have non-contiguous fill. Um, if you see at the top here, there's contiguous. And if you have it unchecked, that means anything that's selected that's of a similar pixel range, um, like within the tolerance of 32 you know, differences in color points, I guess, however they measure it, uh, will be filled in. So everything that's selected will be filled in unless you have uh, different colors underneath the selection. Like there's a light gray here and a brown and an orange and a white and a yellow covering different parts of these selections. The contiguous fill won't work as you'd like. So you might, this is when you would need to use the paintbrush to actually fill in the selected areas rather than just relying on the paint, the paint bucket tool to fill, if that makes any sense. I'm going to add a little bit more darkness as well to the uh, form shadow running down this part of the onion. And select that color and then maybe go just a little bit more red, a little more saturated. Go ahead and fill that. So I have a question that came up from Alan about the selections. What's that? Um, do you ever use feather when you make the selections, or do you always keep that at zero? Yeah, with this particular method, I'm trying to create hard edges everywhere. So yeah, so feathering turned to zero with the lasso tool. Um, because you can get your blended soft edges very soon when you start using the blender brushes. Uh, so yeah, no reason to have a feathered edge tip from the beginning. Um, just make those hit edges hard and abstract, and don't worry about how it looks. You'll be able to fix it with the blender tool. It's blending and blending still. Something like this with a lot of interesting texture, it's very tempting to blend and blend, you know, a lot because you want it to sort of look like the thing. But with the, with the face that we're going to do next, uh, you know, you don't actually have to worry about this too much. Maybe I should have done something a little simpler like an apple or an orange, but... Anyway, it, it shows the concepts pretty well, I think. And remember, the key thing is to not overdo the blending and get rid of all the hard edges. You want some hard edges. Otherwise, you know, what's the point of doing you know, this exercise? Because it's, it's to teach you how to use a combination of hard and soft edges in your painting. And also, I feel like a lot of people have asked about how to blend. And so this is like... Yeah, this is one exercise. way. Like, I almost never use the blending, this actual blending tool when I'm working. I just use it very sparingly with my normal workflow. But with this tiling approach where you paint in mosaic tiles, first, it, yeah, it's kind of essential because otherwise you're going to have a vectorish looking painting if you don't.
So Lucas made a comment, uh, nice onion, and something that I was not aware of. It is the national vegetable in Poland. Oh, really? <laughs> That's awesome. So doing um, blending that sort of goes across the form is, I think, important too. You don't want all your blending to go in the same direction everywhere because that can get really monotonous looking. And you don't want repetition with this sort of thing because repetition and patterns and stripes, they all sort of break the illusion of what you're trying to do. So find places to, uh, you know, break patterns and to uh, you know, get away from uh, blending the same direction over and over again. I'm just going to make a slightly darker shadow here. I guess sometimes it's called the occlusion shadow underneath the uh, onion. So there's less light getting in. Maybe a little darker. There we go. And use the blending tool to blend that in. I think I'll use the Get Lost Blender again. So anyway, that's the concept. I could definitely refine this a little bit more, but I think I want to get onto the uh, the face. Um, oh, you know, I did. I that highlight almost completely disappeared. I want to get that back in there at least before I move on. Can't leave it like that. All right, I think I'll use my wet bristly blender for this so that there's nice, not a, nice, a lot of nice streaks in it. That's one fine looking onion. Thank you, deer. I'm not a deer. <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, let's go ahead and move on to our subject now, our caricature subject. Let me know if there's any questions. No questions. Okay, so maybe I'll give people a choice. Who do you think I should do? We got Amy Winehouse, who I, I think I painted her once. And, uh, oh, where did it go? I don't think it's open right now. The other one, my, my other choice. Here, let me open that real quick. Uh, We'll just tell us. Benedict, then. there he goes. Benedict Cumbersnatch, whatever his name is. Um, I like Benedict's face, but Amy's really cool too. I love the lighting on her face. Uh, I guess I'll just go ahead and do it. You think I, I should do Amy, huh? I don't know. Can we vote? Well, I don't want to take too much time to do things like voting. Um, I mean, you can chime up in the chat. Maybe I'll do Benedict for a future stream if people want to see him. But I, I need to do more ladies, I think, in my caricatures. Yes. So um, let me go ahead and... To close that down. No one's voting anyway, so I guess. Uh... Oh, first vote Amy. Second <laughs> vote Benedict. Third vote Amy. Amy, it is. Okay. I'm, the, I'm the tiebreaker. Otherwise. Alrighty. Everyone says Amy. Okay, so I'll keep that up here. Pardon me, I gotta move these windows around a little bit so I can manage. There we go. All righty. Okay, like with the other one here, I'm going to, uh, um, I guess I'll just go ahead and fill the background with a simple I guess it's a bluish purple color for the background. Like everything about this photo is like purples and oranges. That's like the only two colors in here. Uh, so I'll start with purple, for, bluish purple for the background. And now let's break that up with, uh, oh, I think it's a little lighter at the top than it is at the bottom. So I'll do like a uh, lower part here, a little bit darker.
And just a little bit darker still here. Okay. Let's, I'm going to draw her whole face in, basically her whole head and face together because I just see it as one unit. This is sort of like, I don't know, like a banana shape or something. Almost like the, um, the alien from the alien movies. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but she's got this, you know, big beehive hairdo that sort of extends out back. And... That just made me chuckle. Sorry. Yeah. It. You know, as a caricaturist, you have to think about things like, what do they remind you of? You know, and then, that, then that's helpful for uh, figuring out uh, what shapes you might want to design into the caricature. I just expected, since you drew an onion and then you said banana, that the next thing you were going to say would be food related. So <laughs> I was kind of surprised by the alien. Yeah. But I can see it now. Yeah. So you can see I filled in the selection area here the the selected area but because the background has different colors on it and the tolerance is only set to 32 it's uh uh it didn't cover all the way so yeah i had to uh, fill a couple times and then there's this purple line here where the division was so i just gotta just paint that in real quick so it doesn't oh that's the blend tool still uh, let me just get like a hard round brush here and just oh still yeah when you go to the smudge tools any other brushes you pick after that tend to want to stay um uh, as as a smudge version of that brush, so be careful of that. I think it depends on your maybe on your settings. I'm not really sure how that works. Okay, now let's divide the hair from the face as best we can. Uh, the hair color is basically a dark, dark bluish purple. Um, at least it should be because of all the ambient light there. It's basically the whole stage is lit up. This background light is all bluish and purple, and the primary light on her face is this warm orange color. So anything that's not lit by that large orange light on her face is going to be lit by the reflected light, by all that bluish purple light. Now, how did you get those colors? Did you sample the photo? No, no. I'm just sort of eyeballing it. And it's, you know, it looks very unnatural and orange, but hopefully I'll be able to make that, you know, work. I'm just using my best judgment. Because I know you never sample photos, but I wasn't sure. Okay, adding a little bit of, uh, I'm trying to sculpt the actual face here. And there's the neck, and then the hair down here. Okay, so all this is hair. Let's go ahead and fill that in. Okay, and I'm going to be refining the shape a little bit more. It's just really, really rough right now. It's a little, um, you know, this probably isn't the face shape I'm going to end up with, but... We'll see here. Um, and next thing, let's sculpt out the uh, curvature of the jawline. And anywhere where there's this shadow, I'm just going to try to connect all shadows together because it's going to save me time here. Uh, let me add to that. Let me change the shape of this here. I'm holding down the shift key to add to that selection. Go. All right, and I'll sample this orange color of the face and then just take that down a little more reddish and a lot darker. It's going to be pretty saturated. And maybe something like this. Okay, let's, um, I think her forehead slopes back a lot more. Let's cut her hair back into her forehead here. Use the hair color. Paint in that selection there. All right. Now I'm just going to go a little bit more freestyle here. I'm just going to just start drawing with the freehand lasso tool. Uh, and I'm going to try to sculpt out the plane, the underplanes of the nose and the eyes just to start getting a sense of her likeness here. And it might be a little funky because I'm not using my traditional like center lines, uh, cross lines on the face to make sure things are lined up. So things might be a little wonky, but this is just a different way of working. It sort of frees you up in a way. It, it gets you out of the, the same habits if you're a 
very strict draftsman if you are uh, um, very used to just careful line drawings this will definitely get you out of that because you can't do that and you're, you're designing shapes in a completely different way using this method Okay, yeah, the eyes and the nose. I feel that's a pretty good start right there. So let me go ahead and fill that in with a color that's not quite as dark as what's under the chin. But I'll sample the chin color, I think, anyway, and then just lighten that up a bit because I don't think the underplane of the nose in the in underside of the eyes are quite that dark. I know you're not really going through shortcuts and all of that, but uh, people are talking about the different shortcuts to like fill. Yeah, those are um, those are all in the program somewhere under preferences. You can change them if you want, but um, yeah, I mean, just some simple ones like the letter I on the keyboard is the, for the eyedropper tool. I think G is the paint bucket fill tool. Well, they're talking more about to fill the selection, like control backspace and uh, what's the other one? I forget the X. Uh, fill, you can also do, yeah, control backspace. Um, X is, uh, oh, control D is to deselect uh, an item. But yeah, I have that all programmed on my remote here, so I'm not really going through any of those right now. Uh, that's why I did it, though, so it doesn't slow me down. You know, I've got it, sort of the button positions memorized in my uh, hand here. So it's definitely something, if you want to play with it, I, it definitely is useful to get um, familiar with the keyboard shortcuts or to customize them to make your own keyboard shortcuts. Or, you know, put them on an express key or something. Express key remote, I should say, or the express keys on the side of your tablet. Okay, I'm going to add a little bit of bulk to her muzzle area here. You know, she she always strikes me as someone, I mean, she has a large, long nose, but she also has very large mouth and full lips, and I don't think there's quite enough room here uh, for that. So I'm going to grab my current selection and drop it down a bit here going to move it so you know this kind of thing definitely i think can help if you just if you stay on top of it and really stay analytical about your uh about your process here and be honest with yourself about how the drawing's coming along there we go i'm going to fill in these with this white gap here obviously i just needed to move that down Someone is asking, hmm? is your, Alan's asking, is your Express Key Control a Wacom product? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that an add-on or did that come with your Cintiq? Um, but this one I had to buy it separately. It was an add-on. I think the newer Cintiqs come with it, though, because the newer Cintiqs don't have built-in Express Keys on the side and they expect you to use this, which I think is a cheesy, cheesy move. I don't like that at all. Um I really liked having the express keys on my the side of the uh, on the Cintiq because I mean the battery on this isn't you know lasts forever and if it, the battery's dead and you want to get work done you have to wait till it charges up before you can have express keys back. So I, I don't like the fact that the newer Cintiqs have don't have express they, keys built in. They don't. No. Oh. Yeah, they're just I guess they wanted a cleaner look or something. Um, but yeah, it looks. Uh, I mean, it's practically it's not as a good decision. I think. We'll drop this nose down a little bit too. Okay, and I can I can see a likeness forming here, so that that's a good sign. I think it's definitely not my normal look of my drawings that I do, but you know it looks like cut and paste or a, a bad paint by numbers. Uh, you just got to have faith in the process. 
Okay. Now, drawing the mouth is always tricky, um, especially tricky when it's now a, using a lasso tool to draw a selection. I need to make my picture a little bigger here, which means I need to shrink that down. Sorry about that. Just a little adjustment I needed to make here. Okay. There we go. So the fundamentals of her likeness are locked in here, I think. Well, not locked in. I mean, still definitely I can move it around and change it. But now I got to um, start thinking about building up more um, complicated shapes here, getting the eyebrow colors, getting the eye colors, and that sort of thing. Because I need the correct values and colors to push around. I can't do it quite yet. So drawing things like eyes, noses, mouths, the exact features, this is where you need to slow down maybe a little bit, like I'm trying to do here, to uh, be a little more accurate. And it isn't always the most fun and exciting process to watch doing this particular style. Um, but uh, I think it's worth it if you want to have some patience and give it a try. It's better than watching paint dry. Yep. It never dries, technically. Okay, her eyes, the whites of her eyes are still going to be yellowish, just because, you know, you don't want it to break the illusion of the lighting that's up there. Just going to be a lighter, more gray version of what's, uh, what's there. The inside of the nostrils definitely are not going to be bluish purple. I always like to do those a warm color because uh, they just look wrong if you uh, if you make the inside of the nostril cool, just because of the the light that bounces around inside the nostril. You know, there's blood beneath the surface. You got subsurface scattering, so it's going to create, I think, a a warmer dark underneath that area. Okay, let's get some highlights on the hair because that will help us get a fuller, wider range of values uh, that will help sculpt the forms and will give us a little more leeway about what to do on the face. I don't want to move on to the rest of the face yet until I've got more of the uh, full range of colors and values uh, here. So I'll just have the shift key held down here while I'm adding to the selection. This is where you can have a little more fun, be a little more loose and carefree with the uh, selection tool. Because all this stuff it can get smudged later. You don't have to be really specific with sh things like shapes in the hair, which can go a little more abstract. Okay, so it's going to be a 
bright glowing magical blue color i think almost white but very very chromatic still very dark very light very intense of a light, light blue okay, i'm gonna try to fill but yeah not everything gets filled in because there's different colors within that selection area so i need to cover the rest by using the paintbrush tool to just sort of manually paint in the rest of the selection Okay, cool. Now that I've got that, I can add the, the cool blue highlight to her face or this sort of rim lighting without feeling too odd about it because if I didn't have this blue on the hair, adding blue to the face might seem a little too much. Like, oh no, I can't get away with that. That's too much blue. But yeah, now that the blue's there, this doesn't look so, this won't look so weird. Are you still on the same layer? Oh yeah, this is all one layer. No need for multiple layers in a painting like this. I mean, because, you know, with layers, you just, you're trying to preserve your work, basically, so that it, uh, um, so that you can go back and it's, you know, non-destructive. But, I mean, you need all the paint on the same layers here to blend. Otherwise, it won't work. You got to blend everything together. And there's no point in being precious with it yet, because you're not doing a super precise drawing. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's just really about, just let it, just let it be, let it flow, let it go. Don't be too attached to it. Don't be too precious with it. Oh, please don't sing that Frozen song. <laughs> so I'm going to sample the face color, and it's not going to be... I'm going to. I'm definitely going to go cooler and bluer with it. I'll probably pick from like a purplish-red color, but it won't be full blue, not like on the hair. Because it is blue lighting, but it's mixed with the warm, the warmth of her flesh, the warmth of the local colors of her flesh. But definitely needs to read as bluish, otherwise it won't work. Okay, let's try this. Yeah, that feels pretty good. Maybe, maybe a little bluer. There we go. Okay, and I'm going to do a bit of that same kind of rim lighting on her nose. Which has, I can uh, further describe the sort of the peaks on her nose a little bit more now. Um, let me actually redraw with a darker, it's like a slightly darker color. Well, I'm going to draw the selection first, but I'm going to fill it with a slightly darker color. And then add the rim lighting on top of it. You'll see what I mean in a second. So I'm going to pick that dark orangish red brown color to redraw the contour of the nose. There we go. Because I needed that a bit of a border between, you know, separation between the cheek and the front plane of the nose. And I might zoom in here a little bit just so you guys can see a little bit better, but normally I probably wouldn't zoom in. I would just sort of try to wing it from that distance. It a couple times here trying to get pretty precise shape okay and it actually connects with the light that's on here her upper lips so let me connect that as well add a little bit more to that selection right there okay I'll take that same color from the front plane of the cheek and fill that. Okay. Now let's do some uh, values on the side planes of her cheeks here. Let's get a slightly darker color for her cheekbone or her rouge. And anywhere else I can put it too. I don't want to just put these tiles in one place. I want to, wherever I can find a place to put it, I'll put this slightly darker color under her uh, lip here. Maybe it'll be a transition color between the jawline shadow and the uh, half tones on her the front of her face. And her ear is actually showing too. I didn't uh, 
indicate that, but let's add that in a little bit. And where else can I put it here? Um, maybe running down the side of the nose a little bit. And maybe just on the outside corner of the eye. All right. So let me select the flesh color here, the main flesh color, and go just a little darker and a little bit redder. And let me just use the paintbrush here to make sure I fill in all the areas that I wanted it to appear. There we go. It's starting to flesh out. It's starting to feel better. Let's do the side plane of the nostril here. Use that same color again, I think, in these areas. Now let's uh, find some lighter half tones. On the forehead here, and on the front plane of the cheek. I'm not doing the highlights just yet, but just a slightly lighter value of the flesh tones. So what I'm really doing here is I'm focusing on breaking down these half tones, these these lights on the face, into just subtle changes of value. So I'm really examining these things here and being pretty critical. Uh, and this is again good training for painting in that respect because I have to create these tiles of color at a specific value, at a specific shape, in a specific place, uh, and hopefully they'll read correctly. Yeah, that's, that's a little too yellow, not quite light enough. There we go. Okay, now let's do the highlight on the cheek here. And a bit of a highlight, I think, on the forehead. It's not going to be quite as bright as the um, cheek, but I want a little bit of a highlight. And one on the nose here, the tip of the nose. Okay. So make that just a little bit more yellow, a little lighter. Okay, now let's create some, uh, just a little bit more interesting texture in her hair here. There's all these little blue strands of hair that's being, that's picking up some highlights, but definitely not as bright as anything that's in the, uh, on the lit side. But it's going to help show the direction of the hair, the sort of curvature to the strands to the strokes it is taking on this sort of like spiraling beehive shape Okay, and if there's there's some strands in the hair here that got, I think, um, too much of a selection drawn around them, they became too big, so I'm going to actually subtract from the selection by holding down the Alt key and cutting away if there's any areas that are just too thick. Or if I want to break them up into smaller strands, just using the um, Alt key will help do that. Okay, let's go ahead and um, select the color of the hair and then find a lighter, bluer version of that color and then fill and uh, finish it up with the paintbrush in case there's any areas that didn't get properly filled there we go and she's got a bit of a tank top on here don't want her to make her look like she's topless so let's add a little strap to her shoulder I'm going to use the same orangish color because it's sort of a light white color with uh, black polka dots, but I'm just going to average it out to sort of a light gray, which translates to still sort of a yellowish color because uh, it's, it's lit by a warm light. And 
Okay, I want to get the highlights in the eyes here because at this point now, I'm getting to the point where I'm going to start smudging it soon, but I still need a little bit more to work on here. Like actually her the pupils or her irises are light, sort of the brownish color. And the pupils. Because remember, I'm not going to be doing any paint brushing, any use of the paintbrush, so I'm not going to add any more shapes to this. I'm just going to smudge what's here, so I need a little bit more stuff going on. There we go. Okay, and these will definitely be the lightest lights in the picture, the, uh, the highlights in the eyes. But they're going to have some warmth to them still because what's reflecting in her eyes is the warm stage light. So it's going to be very yellowish. It's basically a, almost a pure white, just with a yellow, yellowish tinge to it. Okay, maybe a little bit more um, explanation of the lips as well is in order. So I need to go a little bit darker here. The separation. And I know her mouth's open just a little bit. You can see just a hint of teeth, but I'm not going to do that. It's just, it's so close to being closed, I'll just keep the mouth closed for this picture. Um, oh, and let's, let's give her the earrings, I guess. Kind of helps complete her look. First, we got the shadow of the earring on her neck. Which is going to be basically the same color and value as what's underneath the chin. Maybe a little bit more, a little darker, a little chromatic. And then the actual earrings, which are sort of an oval shape, a bit of a ring. Just draw the outside shape first, and then I can add the smaller effects to it. And then he's got these sort of tiger spots on it. Okay. I think that's just about it here. Let me redraw the shape of her shoulder a little bit more naturally here. Soften that or just round it off a little bit more. All right, so I think I'm ready to, well, almost ready. I keep on seeing all these things that I want to add to it, like the lips here need maybe a little bit more of a uh, lighter value and a bit of a highlight. Because, like I said, this is once I start smudging, I'm not going to add any more to it. It's that that's part of the exercise. I mean, I I could I could add harder edged shapes, but I'm not going to use a paintbrush. In other words, 
So, I mean, it's not, it doesn't have to be as strict as what I'm saying. It's just, you want to try to limit yourself, I think, and give yourself these barriers, um, you know, obstacles when you're doing this kind of work because it forces you to be more careful during the painting process. And, you know, a good way to test and ask yourself, like, how you're doing with this whole thing is, like, you can zoom out on it, make it look really small. And if it looks pretty good from a small size, it's a good, there's a good chance it's going to be uh, a nice when you blend it. Because really, it's just your eyes blend it when it's at this size. It does the blending for you if the values are good. I think it's okay. I think it could maybe use some tweaking. And the likeness is okay, but I think I'm going to just go ahead and go with this. Um, you know, maybe just real quick tweak to the eyes, <laughs> a little bit thicker eye, ma uh, eye makeup here. Then I'll be ready to go. So Alan has another question. What's that? While exploring the placement of the tiles superimposed, do you make the back layer tiles larger to avoid gaps of missing color? Um, well, I, I initially cover the whole canvas with like that purple color. So any gaps that show through will be background color. So they won't be that noticeable. But yeah, I mean, I guess I might err on the side of making oversized tiles in the beginning. And, uh, but then like, yeah, they'll, they'll definitely find their way poking through some of the other tiles if you're not careful. So it's just a matter of, um, yeah, just look for anything that sticks out and make sure you cover up any, uh, errant background colors that shouldn't be there. And once you start smudging, some of that will be covered up. Yeah. Yeah. True. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go ahead and. Let's start smudging. Actually, before I do, I'm going to save this because I do like to save the tiled version of it first. So I can compare the two later. Uh, because it's all on the same layer, so it's going to basically be destructive. I guess I could duplicate this layer too, but I'm just going to save two versions of the file. All right, let's start with my Get Lost Blender. Make it a little bigger here and... Just start with the background. The background's always a safe place to start. There's a lot of like, you know, neon and different lights behind her, but I'm not really worried about that. I'm just after an interesting painting that sort of represents the feeling of what's going on in the photo and not being super precise with all of that. Okay, the hair hairline is a good place to soften things up. If you're not sure about where to start, just start with the hairline. <laughs> Let's get over to the um, canvas texture blender here and pick up some of this light blue color because it'll help. That's part of the color. It's sort of a loaded smudger, remember? So it's going to pick up whatever colors in your foreground color choice. And if you use it in other places, make sure you uh, readjust, you know, reselect that current color that you're working in, like the, the, the dark of the hair here, if you don't want to bring a foreign color into that hair from somewhere else. Take the background color to smudge the background color into the hair. And I'm breaking it up too because her hair is pretty chaotic. I mean, it's kind of a mess.
for it? Have you ever drawn Amy Winehouse before? Yeah, once I did her for um, my uh, Proco caricature course. She was one of the samples I did. I think I used her for the spirit animal lesson. Uh, I think I based her likeness off of a tropical bird of some sort. <laughs> or maybe it was a bird of paradise flower. It was something like a bird or a flower or something like that. Okay. Let's go into the face now here. Um, let's get... Uh, yeah, let's start with the the Get Lost Blender again, because that's the strongest of all the blenders, and it really softens edges between things fairly well. But i got to be a little bit careful with it. I don't want to overdo it and just get rid of all my hard edges everywhere. I'm looking at my reference photo, think, looking about where I want to soften edges, where I want to keep them a little harder. And being, I'm being pretty sparing with it. I'm not going too crazy. You want that difference. You want that combination of hard versus soft edges. So like around the eyes, I'm going to be a little more careful about how I soften and blend because I don't want them to get totally soft. And also keep a track of the size of the brush you're, of the blending brush you're using. If it's too big for an area, size it down. Zoom in a little bit here. I'm going to make my blender brush a little smaller now. And I'm going to go in around the eyes and, uh, and soften some of the things here. Not too much. So would you say this process that you're doing right now is quicker for you or takes longer for you than what your usual workflow is? You know, it's it's hard to say. It's actually, it's going faster than I thought it might go. I mean, we're almost out of time, but, um, but I feel like I've actually gotten pretty far in the painting with an effect that's really cool. I lately tend to like to do a, a quite a bit of rendering and adding textures to my paintings. So I would say I probably spent a lot longer doing that. Um, and this, but this doesn't produce that same effect. So if I want this to be like a portfolio piece, I'd probably need to spend a, quite a bit of time on it to bring it up to a level of rendering. So I might switch back to a paintbrush and start painting on top of this, just if I was doing this on my own. As an exercise, as a demonstration though, I'm not going to do that here, just because I want to show this concept. And how you can actually, you can get a really good, you know, finished piece here. Finished looking, you know, well, like an experiment, or if, I mean, if you want this to be your finished style, you definitely can. Um, but it needs, uh, you know, I think it needs some work. It just depends on your aesthetic and what kind of clientele you're trying to attract. 
you know, if you want to do a magazine cover, it's not necessarily going to go for something quite like this, which is a little bit, you know, it's a little rough, um, but it's very painterly. It's like sort of a fine art caricature style, I think. Pop art. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Load up really big and put it on a canvas. But I like to have quite a bit of refinement in my work where it's, you know, real good control of the shadows and the highlights and the, the half tones and just everything just has to be a little bit more, I don't know, more worked out. I mean, that's your style. Yeah, that's just what I'm known for. That's what I tend to do because I like that look. But I, but I also really like this look. And I think my typical over maybe overly rendered style could benefit from this type of work where it's uh, more, you know, abstracted, simplified. Because you can definitely do caricatures with a real simplistic style and still get a really realistic effect that will, I think, impress people, especially when it, looking at it from a distance. When you're looking at it up close like this, you know, it's you can see a lot of the funkiness to it. But, you know, you might like that funkiness. Uh, but, you know, one thing that bothers me, I think, in my own work, if I don't fix it, it's the misalignment of the features, it's bad perspective, uh, you know, the weight distribution of the face being a little bit off. Like, I, I like to correct that with things like the abstraction, you know, where I trace over it with, with more of an eye towards anatomy and uh, perspective. And, uh, but yeah, this one definitely, I think, might fail the perspective and anatomy test. Um, but that's okay. You know, it's not, it's not what I'm after here today. Today, what I'm after is painting techniques and teaching this as a concept to look for this type of thing in your own work or ways to approach it that might be a little bit different than what you're used to. Um, yeah, so it's just a, um, it's a method that, uh, more teaches a concept, not necessarily something I would work in exclusively, but you can, you definitely could if you wanted to. Yeah. I mean, I think it's pretty much done, right? For the exercise part. Yeah. I mean, you could fine tune it all day, but Yeah, definitely. But I'm 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 having a lot of fun playing with edges here, which I don't do enough of in my own work, like dragging the background into the subject, um leaving really really distinct hard edges next to really really softened edges. Uh, stuff like that, I, you know, in my own work, I maybe treat it so realistically that it loses a little bit of the spontaneity. And this is a great way to get spontane spontaneity and, you know, painterly quality back into your work. So you might do a combination of techniques where you start off doing something like this and then you switch to a paintbrush. Like I said, what I might do if I wanted to refine this further, I'll, um, yeah, maybe I'll just start going back into it with my regular paintbrushes now, you know, when the stream is over. I like it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But yeah, I think that's just about it now. We're just about out of time. Is there anyone with any uh, questions? I mean, does the procedure seem pretty straightforward? Um, if you have any technical questions, let me know. Um, or if you don't think of them now, if you're watching the stream later, please leave them in the comments and I'll try to get to them as soon as I can. I think she could use one more layer of a highlight on her hair too, just like a really light white, because I do see that happening. Let's um, add a bit of a lasso back to her hair here, the lasso selection tool. And find other little places to add a little bit more of that pure white. Well, almost pure white. I'm not going to go totally pure white. It's still going to have some blue in it, but. It's going to be really light. There we go. And then just smudge that a little bit more. So I know you're most likely going to continue on this after the stream. Where will people be able to see the final? Um, well, if I finish it and do any more to it, I'll post it on my Facebook page and on my Instagram, probably. Um, 
my Facebook, you know, just Court Jones on Facebook, Court Jones Studio, I think. And my Instagram is at Court Jones Artist. You can also follow Debbie on Instagram at Debbie Does Drawings. Um, if you want my brush pack too, that's just um, off on my website. There's a store where you can buy it from, or on Gumroad. You can also buy my brush pack that has these blenders in it. Did you put your new links up on Instagram? No, I will though. Yeah, I'm going to put a link tree up on uh, my Instagram uh, bio that has links to all of my stuff. Not Right now it's just linked up to my YouTube page. So anyway, there we go. There's Amy Winehouse for now. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining in and uh, participating. Um, again, if you have any more last minute questions, now's the time to ask. <laughs> Uh, hey, Shiny. Yeah, you're late. <laughs> um, but you can check it out uh, in the replay. Yeah, anyway, great. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, everybody, for participating. And we'll see you again, I guess, in two weeks. Uh, I think I'm falling into this rhythm where I like the every two-week schedule that I can I can sort of plan a little bit more ahead of time what I'm going to do in the stream. And each stream will be a little bit better because of it. So say bye, Debbie. Bye. All right, we'll see you guys soon.